Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is Friday, or not Friday, it is Monday. I'm going to say it's Monday, um, Allegheny College's new Friday. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, one quick announcement that I'll make before I get started with too, too much here, um, and that is that um, we may have to have the presentation times for our, our um, presentations that are coming up next week. Those presentation times may have to happen not over lab, but during class time. And that is because the speaker um, that we're going to be having during our May 10th lab um, may not be able to come, well, he, sorry, he may not be able to come except for during lab time. I was trying to get him to come during a class time, but it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. And so um, I'll let you know, hopefully by the end of today, or even, well, certainly by, by next class time, I'll let you know exactly when that's going to be. But I think, though, that anticipate having your presentations during class time, um, just because that appears to be the uh, lab time, appears to be the only time that our speaker can come in. Our speaker is going to be Tom Helicar. He's from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, which is the capital of Nebraska. Um, and he is in a research lab, and he's doing some really amazing things. He's an excellent speaker. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to hearing what he has to say. And so I really, really would like to have him come and uh, introduce his work and his um, and his his uh, his ideas to you because I think that um, I think it could be like a, a really good um, a really good talk. Um, also uh, on Wednesday the um, test is coming out for this class. We have exam two, um, and so if I can uh, just stop for a second and talk about that. The exam is coming out, yes, and it's going to be um, basically just happening over um, uh, class time. And so I'm not going to have class on Wednesday, but rather. Um, what I'm going to do is just release the test on Sakai. In fact, you can find the, the notes here. I'm going to release the test on Sakai's quizzes um, at class time. That means on Wednesday at, um, what, 10.40. And then that'll be that. And then you have 24 hours to take this. In fact, you'll see on the second page, uh, you have 24 hours to take the, um, uh, to take the test. That's, you have these slides already. This is from the, uh, the 28th of April, so you have these slides. Um, anyhow, so you have that, and so then I think that um, that'll be good, and then on, on, you'll just uh, turn this in on, on Thursday. Now, it is a 24-hour test, but I don't expect you to spend 24 hours working on this thing. You can probably take about two hours to work on this. And so it's going to be very, very, I mean, very, very similar uh, in, in structure to the first exam that we had, where you'll have multiple choice and some written components, and that's about it. Um, I was going to have some more fancy things in there, but um, maybe this is already good where it is. Um, it's going to be conceptually oriented, concerning material from class, discussions, slides, and activities. So really, the stuff we do in class. Not labs, but class stuff. Um, the, I mean, the labs are, are something else, but the, the, if you, to, to study for this thing, basically just study your slides and you'll be good to go. Um, let's see, slides for notes and structure, yeah, so use the book for detail, I mean, we do have the book, and the book does provide detail, but basically, though, it's the slides that you want to be spending more time looking at. Um, and then you have some topics that I've already mentioned um, before about what to expect on this. And so if you're interested in finding out, um, or if, if, I mean, if, you, if you're interested in looking at these, uh, these things more closely, um, you can find this particular uh, slide that we covered last week on the 28th of April, and that should give you some ideas about what to expect. What I wanted to talk about today, though, is if you go ahead and pull over your class docs repository, um, you'll find in there a new slide. Uh, uh, you'll find for like the 22nd um, uh, discussion that we have here, the 22nd class. Um, and what we're talking about today is we're, we're talking about uh, protein domains. Now, this is actually quite an interesting area. I think that we'll probably have to start this today. Um, we'll probably have, well, there's no class on Wednesday because of the exam. And then on Friday, we'll have to finish this. And so, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in this, in this particular slide deck. But I think that it's all very, very interesting, though. I just couldn't think of anything to pull out of this when I was going through my slides last night. I just, everything seemed so exciting. And so what I would like to talk about, though, is, the, um, what, we, let's, what, is what these, these, uh, these proteins, once we figure out how they fold, we can get an idea about how they can be used. And so when we have, when we're talking about protein folding here, we're talking about like proteins that are kind of being put into some kind of, you know, I don't know, some kind of, uh, they're, they're given in some kind of shape that can, that can do some, some, that has some function. They can do something. They're in a structure for a function. Now remember that when you're talking about proteins, structure and function are very intimately connected here. I mean, they're very connected. It's almost like if you don't have the right structure, it's probably, 
you don't, you won't, you'll never have the right function. So if you, if, you want the, if you want the function for something, you have to make sure that you have the right structure. It's that simple. Um, and this really works in the in re regular everyday life. We've discussed this before, like the chairs that you may be sitting in or the, the desks that you may be standing in front of or wherever it is. Um, they all have a specific type of you know, building uh, code, if you will, so that there's four legs on the floor, there's a place for you to sit if you're using the chair or if you're standing at a desk, then there's like a place, there's like a flat surface with the legs underneath it um, where you can, you can put your things. I mean, so there's a specific kind of way that you make a chair and the way that you make a table. Anyhow, um, this is an interesting paper though, where this is kind of that same idea where it became um, kind of well understood in terms of, uh, of proteins, where they suddenly realized, hey, wait a minute, the way that the protein folds really kind of indicates what it can do. And so here's this paper that came out by Wettlaufer, um, nucle nucleation, uh, rapid folding, and globular um, or globular interchange regions in proteins, which is actually quite an interesting um, paper, though, where they're saying that not only do, paper, do, do, do um, uh, proteins fold in specific ways, uh, there appear to be specific areas in proteins which simply must fold the same way um, each time, otherwise. Uh, they will not fun the protein doesn't um, have specific functions. And so in other words, they're saying that there are sensitive areas in proteins and there are non-sensitive areas. And the sensitive areas are areas that if they don't get folded, I mean, you, can, you might be able to make some mistakes in your protein and have it fold in a different way you know, from what it should be. Maybe it gets denatured, maybe it gets too hot, maybe it gets too cold or something happens. And so maybe the protein folds a little bit differently. But there's a range inside that where you can where, you, where that difference is, and the protein should still be able to function when you're inside that range of like maybe too much salt or too much heat, or whatever it may be. But there are very specific areas in protein where if you try and change the folding just a tiny bit, then you suddenly loses some some ability to to fulfill a task. And so they're saying that you know there's like this area that if you if you bend this one area, then it doesn't work as well. It's kind of like if you have your car and you like you know you take out the engine, for instance. Of course, it still looks like a car, but and the radio may still function, and maybe the uh, I think what else would still function? Maybe the electric windows would still function, um, but it wouldn't go anywhere. And so it's like you have a very kind of a there's a, there are sensitive areas. Um, so anyway, here we have um, getting back to structures. Here, these are just some some pictures of structures that we you can see a folding bike, for instance. Uh, it, it kind of like collapses up into a, into a smaller shape and then it uncollapses into a bigger, regular bike again. And if you bend any piece in this, if you, if you bend this folded, if the bike is folded and you, and you bend, say, you know, one of these spokes or something like that so that it prevents the unfolding, then your bike is kind of not able to be used. And so you're, there's a, it's, it's, it's more than just folding proteins here, but there's like specific areas that just cannot be tampered with. Anyhow. Let's get to that in a second. So this is my favorite example here. I was just taking a picture of my car in the, in the yard this morning. I just got up this morning and gave it a quick wash and used some turtle wax. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll take a picture of this thing and put this in. Um, this is Aston Martin. <laughs> this isn't my car, but this is, okay, I got it online. Okay, but still, this is a uh, interesting car. And the nice thing about this picture though, is that every car that we have here, many different pieces about it that make it functional. So there's, I call this one car, many functions. So for instance, you have in the car a windshield, and the windshield allows the driver to see out of the car when he or she is driving. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental. If you, don't, if you can't see out of the windshield, then the car cannot drive. It doesn't matter what the engine looks like, it just cannot drive. It wouldn't be safe. Um, you have a ventilation system in the front of the car here, which is like in the, in the hood, and that's for cooling so that the engine doesn't get too hot. Now, if you're driving down the street and your car gets too hot, then you know it's gonna, it's it's not gonna work very well. You have headlights in front of the car. These are specific types of structures that allow the car to drive at night, so you can still see it. They light up the road. Um, we have a license plate so that allows the car to be identified. You have wheels on the on the road, and you have a door. And so these are all parts of the car that are very unique, you know, pieces. To the, every car has to have them, but they're very very unique. You know, they they all fulfill specific duties. You wouldn't expect the wheel to be used as a door, and you wouldn't expect the door to be used as a wheel. It's just, it's it just, they're not interchangeable. They actually do fulfill very specific, you know, functions. Uh, and you'll find that, for instance, in proteins, uh, you have these regions which are very sensitive, 
which also produce or have, or have specific types of functions. So like for instance here, uh, this, is a, this is one function, if you will, one giant function, in fact you can click on this if you want, and this one, this one protein has these different areas that do things. Like there's the red area, there's this orangey area, there's the green area, maybe there's arguably two green areas, but maybe there's just one separated by a cord, and then there's the blue area. These areas in proteins all function very, very similarly to this car. The car, but the car has headlights, doors, wheels, windows, a heating system or a heat loss system, you know, ventilation system. It has all these specific things that allow it to function, and that is to drive. And in this protein, it has very specific sub-functions or some sub-pieces, uh, which allow this, this protein to function in the same way. It, it does something, but little pieces in this protein handle specific types of functions. And so if you click on it, you can get an idea about, you know, you can, you can kind of get a 3D view. Oops, can't really see this. You can get a 3D view of this protein. You can kind of look around. But these regions of different color here, those are domains. That's what we call domains. And so they are specific regions in proteins uh, that have very specific types of functions. So that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about these, these domains. So yes, it is a protein. And yes, it was created by, from you know, RNA, and, and that was created from DNA before it. But in this protein, though, you have these areas that actually do some, you know, their, their own specific, specific things. And so we call those domains. A protein domain is this area that has a, a function, a specific type of function for a protein. But also, though, interestingly, fascinatingly, um, it's a conserved part of a protein sequence. It's conserved. What does that mean? That means that you find that that domain, this specific domain, or this function, if you will, which is fulfilled by this, that's fulfilled on this protein, um, is also found in other proteins. It's almost like, you know, you can look at genes from, you know, between a goat, between a rabbit, between a rat, between a mouse, you know, any mammal you want, and you might be able to find that same gene, um, more or less untouched, across all those organisms. Well, what I'm saying now is that there are proteins uh, or protein domains and proteins um, which you can find across a, a whole host of different proteins. And so now proteins are becoming the organism in some ways. So this protein may be coming from a rat, may be coming from a rabbit, may be coming from a goat or a horse or whatever it is. Um, and these domains are kind of like still, they're, they're very conserved. Even though the protein itself might be slightly different, the domain is very similar. And that is because, getting back to this car idea, it's just an idea, but that is because it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, I'm pretty sure that the car that you do drive, if you drive a car, would have a door, would have a head shield, or you know, headlights, or a windshield, or would have uh, tires on the ground. It would, have, it would have to have some kind of ventilation system for cooling if it's a fuel car. And so what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter what kind of car you're driving, it has to have the same kinds of functionalities so that it can continue being a car. And in many proteins, so that a protein can continue being a protein, it has to have these domain areas so that it can continue doing what it's supposed to do. And so many proteins um, have these same parts inside their proteins, or inside them, um, which fulfill these functions. And so it could be that, why these, these domains are so conserved. Maybe they evolved separately. Maybe they were all from the same origin, and then they just never, they were just so, so conserved that they never changed. But whatever it, it may be, it's pretty safe to say that the protein would not be able to function if it doesn't have a, its domains. So these domains, can, they can evolve on their own, they can function, they can, list, they can exist independently of the rest of the protein chain. And that is actually quite interesting here. And that is that the protein chain um, can become kind of corrupt and changed and and you know, getting back to the car, the car can become dinged and covered with mud and, and really, really dirty. But that still doesn't change the fact that the tires are still on the road and they're still able to keep you know, a grip on the, on the tarmac or, or, the, or the road when, they, when the car drives. And so they can exist independently. Each domain forms a compact three-dimensional structure, as we know from our proteins. When we look at proteins like this, for instance, these are your domains. And you can, and they can independently be stable and folded. That means you can basically look at these proteins, uh, or the, the protein domains, uh, separately and kind of imagine them, just like zoom in on specific areas and imagine them as standalone parts. And that's how you can kind of get an idea about what they might do as a task.
what their function may be. Of course, that's all experimental. Um, I have this, this, this diagram at the bottom here, um, just because I wanted you to kind of get, get used to seeing these kinds of things. Um, what is this thing here? This is actually how you draw a protein with its domains. And so this line that we see, starting from the red point on the, on the right, and going all the way to the left, or sorry, the, the left to the right, um, this, uh, what does that say, IGT2, this round, the first round circle here is a domain. And then this, this, this pink uh, you know, mini rectangle could be another type of domain, but these are all basically the landmarks or features that you might find, I guess annotations, I should say, um, in a protein. And so these are your domains. Somebody has figured out that this is a domain. They've looked at the protein, they've analyzed it, they found this particular region, uh, and they found that the same region exists in a multitude of other types of proteins too, and they realized that IGT2 and IGC3 and, and all these other things, these other, these other domains can be found in other proteins, and those other proteins are able to fulfill, um, or they're able to do similar types of jo uh, jobs for those other proteins. These jobs, by the way, what kinds of jobs could they be? Well, maybe this protein has to latch on to another protein, to get oxygen, for instance, or maybe it has to move oxygen somewhere. Maybe it has to get some kind of, it has to do something. It has to, it has to stick to something. It has to, it, has to, it has to join to another protein where it gets energy. Uh, who knows? Um, and so that kind of system there where you have to like latch on to something, one of these, these domains could be, could be you know, behaving kind of like, a, uh, I guess, a hinge in some cases, like a hinge that builds between two proteins so that those two proteins can come together and work, and then when they finish their task, they can separate. And so maybe that's what these domains do, and, and maybe, and just maybe, um, that's not the only protein, this is not the only particular protein that has to have that, that, that hinge system. Maybe there are many, many others, and so that's why, for instance, you'd expect to find this domain on other types of domains. Proteins. One thing that I find really quite interesting, though, is the whole notion of something called centony. Centony means ordering of genetic components in a sequence, for instance, or in a sequence of protein, like a, a genetic sequence or a, a And what I mean by this is that if you look at rat, goat, and cat, and some other animals, um, or any animals, really, and you find, you find that there's gene A, gene B, gene C, and gene D, in that order, in cat, you might find that that order is changed when you're looking at dog. Maybe it's D, C, B, and A in that order. Those are the genes. They're like in somehow the same genes are there, but they are not in the same order. And you get the idea right from down here in the bottom. These uh, domains are kind of like landmarks or little areas in, in, in protein sequences. And so you have the, the domains themselves can also change in order, like the placement, the actual physical location where these things are in the protein uh, changes. So this is a, a paper that I found here from PubMed, which is actually quite interesting. It's domain team centony of domains it is, uh, is a new approach in comparative genomics. And so what is this telling us here is that if I know that, for instance, all cats have, G have uh, domains A, B, and C, and D, but uh, the, the tigers have you know, domains A, then domain B, then domain C, then domain D in that order. But if you're a lion, you have maybe domain D, domain C, domain B, and domain A. It's like the reverse of, the order is reversed. Could I use that in some sense to, to run some kind of comparative genomics experiment? In other words, if you give me some kind of protein that's come from a cat, could I look at this, determine where the, the domains are, and then say, well, based upon this order, I know this isn't a tiger because the tiger has a you know, domain A, domain B, domain C, and domain D. This must be a, a, a lion because it's the other way around. And so this is a paper that came out, uh, when is it? it came out in 2007, which is actually quite interesting though, where it's saying, did you know that you could do that? You could actually look at the, cent the centony of these domains and figure out just from an order um, where these, uh, where this, this protein may have come from. Now, that would be relevant, not just in looking at, at, at um, cats, but what if somebody came up to you with a variant of either SARS or COVID, and they're not really sure whether, you know, which, is, which it is. Um, all they know is, is you need to find out what that, that, that particular protein is. Well, what if you look at that protein and you find out kind of 
aha, I find out that there's a domain A. I recognize that because that protein has domain A, and I've seen that domain in many other proteins. Um, I know that protein, uh, the protein has domain B, and it also has domain C, and those domains are also domains that I have seen in other places. And if I know, for instance, that SARS has domain A, domain B, domain C, I mean, obviously, you, there's, there's maybe hundreds of other domains in some of these proteins that you'd be looking at. I mean, not hundreds, but you might have more than just three anyway. Um, but if I know that SARS, and, the, and then the protein that you've just given me that appears to have the same type of function, and I look at the, domain, you know, the domains of this, and I find out that it's B, and then C, and then A, I might conclude that, actually, you know what? These are two different organisms. This is not the same one. This is something different. Yes, it's, this, it's a protein that has a similar function to something I've seen before, but because the domains are out of order, it suggests to me that this is a new, pro this is a new protein. It's a new, it's a new thing of, it's a new way of, uh, it's, a, it's a new protein of some, of some kind. So you can kind of get an idea that maybe by looking at, at that information on top of some other information, like some, you know, obviously you, you use BLAST and you do a, a comparison, uh, you check the pro, you do a BLAST for proteins and you do, and you do a kind of a, You'd see what your E values are to see how closely related one sequence is to another, and then you'd look at the, you know, the comparison and see whether the alignments are suggesting that they're actually the same thing. And if they are, that tells you one thing. But maybe, for instance, you could also look at the domain ordering, as, you, as this paper here is, is suggesting that you can. So there's, uh, what I'm trying to say, though, is that each time you look at, the, um, at comparative genomics, which is really what this type of research is, comparing one protein with another, um, you'll find that there are many, many different ideas that seem to come out every month, it would seem, like even every week, new ideas on how you can compare one thing with another. Because the more you can compare, then the more you can say, this is not the same, or this is the same thing, and if it's not the same, maybe it's a new organism, maybe it means there's a different, like there's, the relationship is different, and maybe they're not related. If, there, if you know that something's the same, then perhaps that means you can treat this, this bacteria or this or this infection in the same way as something else that you know already. And so knowing whether something is the same or different is actually very important. Anyhow, um, so how do we actually find domains? So getting back to this thing, so we know we can use them to compare things, but how do we actually find them? Well, we already know this. We've already done some work with uh, finding landmarks in this class. And so we can use alignment techniques, again alignment, um, with you know, of, of uh, perhaps protein material, or even if you, if you want to go back and be more daring, you can use DNA and say that I know that my protein comes from this DNA. Can I find the actual domain material inside the DNA itself? You know, can I find the actual domain um, you know, code inside the DNA itself? But it's alignment, where you're just comparing uh, two different sequences. You can use BLAST, where you say, okay, well, here's my sequences I have. Someone's given me this thing, and I want to see whether we have ever, I mean we, as the scientific community, whether we have ever come across a similar sequence ever before. And that's why you use alignment with BLAST, and then BLAST would then check your sequence across every other piece of information that it knows um, in its giant database. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's not the only database that you could use, though. There's another database called the PFAM, which is actually quite interesting. You can click on that. These are all links. PFAM is actually very similar, where you can do a search for specific types of proteins, and you get some visuals just like this. It talks about where you can find these domains, like for instance, like down here, this is the PAS domain in the example, this is the PeeWee domain. But these are all, um, this is like a whole website just dedicated to proteins and what the domains are doing in the proteins, which is actually quite exciting if you think about it. And so I can go to, let's see, go back to the, the org, or name website here, oops, can't go to that one. Of it at home, where I think I can go ahead and just do a quick search, sequence search. If you see what I'm doing right now, I'm doing a sequence search right there, and I'll just type in a, a simple example, and I hit go, and then it will do um, all this kind of the statistical work analysis for me, and I just have to sit here. This may take some time, so I may have to come back to this, but basically it's just that easy, and then once this protein comes up, um, then you'll find out that you'll, you'll get some kind of information about you know, the, the, the domains that it had found in that protein and other, and it would say that I know that these are domains because I recognize them in other proteins as being domains. So that's the PFAM, which is quite interesting. Then we have another one called SMART. You can go ahead and click on that too, and that looks like this, where it's another type of system which allows you to find 
what they call it, architecture research tool. But really what it means is that you can use this to find domains in sequences of, of protein. Um, somewhere, you can do a simple, I forget where it is, I want to spend too all my time here. But you can do, a, you can get some information by clicking on certain things on here and you can find out how things are related. You can maybe find different types of proteins and say, aha, I find out that these two different proteins, while they're from different organisms, uh, they still appear to have the same kinds of domains which exist in them. I think I'm getting kind of, I'm looking at the taxonomy here, which is like the list of relatedness between species. And in this particular page, though, it looks to be, you can use, um, you can find common uh, domains in related uh, organisms, as if that's, if that's your research area. So that's smart, that's pretty cool. Um, another one you can use is called Interpol, or Interpro rather, Interpro. <laughs> um, go ahead and click on that, and this is what the page looks like. Classification of protein families. That's actually quite interesting because notice they call it protein families. And so they're saying that yes, these are proteins, but they're a family. And so that means that never mind the organism, um, these are a group of proteins which help whatever organism they belong to, they help those proteins to build cells, for instance. So they are like, you know, proteins that build other proteins or something, they, or they're assistance proteins. So these proteins help with dividing uh, DNA and maybe copying DNA. And so you can do another type of search here. I can go ahead and put my hidden example, which is down here. And I'll go ahead and just hit search and just see what comes up. I actually quite like, um, I kind of, I, I like this, this system here because it's um, in, in these, these, these demos here, because it, you have like demo uh, sequences that you can go ahead and just plug in and just get an idea about what the results look like when they first come out. And again, this is taking some time. Um, when I, honestly, I know this, is, this seems kind of like I'm making this up, but when I, when I ran this last night, and this one's still running too on PFAM, when I ran this last night, it was about probably 11, Pretty quickly, um, I didn't. I don't think I ran this one. There's some, there is some, there's an example you can run someplace in here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where that would be. It's normal mode, I guess. Oh, here we go. You can click on the normal mode. There's a sequence analysis. I'll just, I'll just put an example in here. I'll hit run the sequence, and then you get some information here. It is this is smart, and this is saying that this example protein that they give us. Um, I just clicked on the main, you know. Um, uh, on the left side here, there's a, on that, that big you know, normal mode. But these are the domains that it is found inside that protein. Now, the reason why this is a tool and not like a, a website rather, and not some standalone um, Python program, um, is because finding these proteins, or sorry, fi finding these domains is very complicated. It's not like just finding you know, a start and stop area of a protein in DNA and saying, I'm done. But rather, you have to take that piece of protein that you find here that you suspect is a domain, and you have to compare that, that particular stretch with seemingly all other proteins that you've ever seen before in the same protein family, and see whether, for instance, um, this is something that's already known. And so smart domain here, a tool says that it found a, a domain called CUB, C-U-B, and it says that I've, not only have I found this thing here in this protein, but I found this in a bunch of other proteins at the same time, so therefore, I believe that this is a domain from this protein. So if I click on this thing, presumably I'll get, here we go, we get the full annotation. So that means I can go ahead and click on some of these domains and get an idea about what is this thing? What does this domain do? This is probably the, one of the most interesting lines I find when you're looking at the, the output of any of these tools, mostly along developmentally regulated proteins. This is uh, Sperma Henson's uh, contain only this domain. This is the most interesting line for me, though, because it tells you what this thing's supposed to do. And I always imagine, you know, who is the person who came up with the, the function? I mean, how did somebody find out what this thing does? It could only come through maybe experimentation and then observation, where they had to, this, you know, they had, they had to run this, 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 uh, this protein through all these different experiments, and they had to find out which of the domains was actually doing something, and then they had to figure out what that domain was doing. And so it probably would have been a very difficult thing to do. But one thing I do like about these tools, I think that most all of them have this, is that you have this button down here, submit to blast. And you can go ahead and like click on these things. And then when you do that, that smart, 
has its own blast link up, which means that it actually runs its own its own database of, of um, you know, it's, it's tapping into the database of all known uh, sequences. So I can see, well, this is the sequence inside my protein which codes for that domain. So now I want to find out where else have I seen this domain before. And so I can go ahead and click on, I'll just go ahead and try this. I'll use the, the local blast that's here, PSI search. Uh, does it give me that? Oh no, where's it gone? I go back here. Uh, someplace I can go ahead and run this thing. I wonder if I have to like actually copy this. Do I have to do that? Here, let's just go to NCBI and see what they say. So they, oh here, so I go to, I'll go to NCBI, and I'm not gonna change anything strange here. I think I do have to change uh, protein, yeah, here we are, the protein sequences. I'll just run blast. This will probably take some time. It will, but what I'm trying to say though is that when these results come through, I can find out where this organism, or sorry, where this, 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 um, this domain was last seen. I mean, where, where else does this domain play a role? And so you can find that, for instance, all of these domains, you've, you, when, you, when you start studying like, proteomics, which is like you know, all things protein, you start studying these domains, you start saying, thinking to yourself, you know, I've FN3, here's a, here's a domain, FN3, or, FN, you know, or this is um, P kinase tyrosine. Um, I've seen that domain someplace before. Where have I seen it before? And then you've probably realized that you've, you've seen it in a lot of places. That's the nature of these domains, and that is that they, you know, they, they do things for proteins that, uh, that have to be done. I mean, you can also look at the tires of your car and say, you know, I've seen the same structure before. Where have I seen a tire before? And you might think, actually, every single roadworthy vehicle has tires. Buses, trucks, cars, you know, trailers. Um, that function to roll is, is necessary for seemingly all vehicles. And you might find out that P kinase tyrosine here um, is necessary for many other types of proteins too. And so in this particular, um, in this, in this uh, graphic, I'm saying that you can find this protein here, or you find this, this domain in this protein, and then you can match it with other proteins, uh, other domains and other proteins, and you'll find out that actually this is one of those, those domains that seems to have you know, functions for, or that plays functions for many different proteins. So that's absolutely awesome, I think. It's just an incredible idea that you can find these pieces that, are, that somehow evolved on their own and they live in proteins, yet somehow they're found in many different proteins regardless of the organism. It's like they just behave doing their own thing. <laughs> so <clears throat> you can find out more, I kind of touched on this by clicking on BLAST, but we can use alignment again, and you can find out about where that, that domain uh, is used and where it's, uh, you know, where, what are the proteins actually have that same domain. And then you'll find out more about that protein's uh, family. In other words, the relatedness, um, you'll say like, how is this, this protein related to other ones? Well, it's related in, in the sense that it has the same function. In fact, if I go back here, is it done yet? Is it still working? Ah, here we go. So my blast result that I just ran earlier over the example protein uh, seems to finish. The first thing, remember, the first thing I look at is this E value. I never look at anything else, I just look at the E value. That's all I care about. If, I had, if I'm happy with the E value, then I might let my eye wander and look at the percent identity and, and that. But basically it's, it's these, it's this one first, the E value, then it's this percent identity. And the lower the E value is, the more likely these things are actually the same they have the same origin in some way. And then what I do look at is the description. And so over here, I'm looking at the description of these proteins, um, hypothetical protein fungi, I don't know what, I'm not sure what that means. But you're basically finding other proteins. That really, what this recommends, or recommends, what this, what this indicates though is that there, there are other proteins out there which also have the same domain. So there must be something magic about that, if you think about that, that other proteins, and if you let your eye run down the the, the, the scientific name, you'll see that there's a lot of different types of names here, a lot of different organisms perhaps that, that these things were named after. But they're very different, you know, they're very diverse. And even going over here, if I look at um, like, you know, the, 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 the descriptions, they again seem like the main proteins are, are probably from very different areas. Yet, they basically have, the, the, each of these proteins has the same, pro, the same domain, and that is this and that's why they're on this list here. They all have this domain for some reason. So then you have to, as a researcher, you'll have to look at these, at the, at the common function behind all of these proteins. 
Well, obviously, you have to look at the, you, you want to look at the, um, the E value, and if the E value is low enough, and it meets a certain threshold to say that they are, really are uh, similar, then you want to go to these descriptions of these different proteins and find out, well, what do they have in common? What function do they have in common that needs to get done? And so um, you're kind of looking at these, you know, they look like they're, they're I'm looking at, I'm, I'm seeing things like protein, proteinase-like features. Proteinases are things that, that basically cut. They're types of cutting agents. They cut proteins. And so maybe this domain has something to do with cutting protein. Who knows? That's part of your research you'd have to do to spend all this time to, you know, to find out, like, I have this domain. What does it do? And so you'd have to look in at these other organisms to see what, they, what it does in there. So there's that. Morning. Anyhow, so we have this alignment. Um, and so you can find out where that same domain has been found in many other areas just by aligning this protein with other organisms and say, hey, hey, I found the same, the same sequence of, uh, of protein in all these different organisms. What, con what connects them? What's, what's common about all of these, these different uh, proteins? Why do they need this, 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 uh, this domain? Um, you can get all kinds of, I mean, there's luckily a lot of this work is, not a lot of it, but much of this work, I guess, has been done for some of the more common domains, which is quite nice because if you think about it, you have um, proteins which are used all the time, and many different types of research uses those proteins. And so um, some science groups here, in the, whenever, whenever they were, have actually figured out that there are some very commonly found domains which absolutely must be there. And they, um, are respond they have certain types of functionalities. And they've, they've done that work for you. And so now you can study how those domains um, are actually doing their job, what, what kind of job that they do. And so again, we can go to places like the, uh, you know, the protein data bank here. In fact, I can just type in this. Maybe I can go to this. This was no, I, sh I should have made this as, as a link, this the, the image, but I didn't. So I can go ahead and just click, oh, here's the link. I can click on this link down here. And I've just, <laughs> it's funny, I've just lost my slides again. Let me just, let me do that again, everybody. Hang on. If I open this up as a new tab, there we go. So then again, I can, again, somebody has found out what, where these domains are. They found out the function and they've, and then they figured them out. And because they were so commonly used, um, they were able to create a, they made a, um, you know, they, they used a computer or some kind of automated system to find out what those things look like. And so these are the more common types of, of um, you know, the more common types of, um, uh, of protein and the more common uh, domains. But this isn't the extent of all known domains. In fact, there are hundreds of, of new domains that are out there uh, which have not been discovered, that have not been completely understood yet. Uh, so what I mean by that is that there, are, there is still there is much opportunity. If you're, if you're waiting to, to become the, the world's foremost expert on different types of, of different types of, uh, of, of, of protein, um, it's, you can still do that. I don't want you to think though that because we have all these databases like you know, um, like this database here that uses um, Inter, Interpro or Smart, or we have uh, NCBI and we have PFAM, which is this is still working. On, by the way, this is still working on the on the on the on the thing here. Must be very very slow. And then we have some other areas too, like I mean, oops, not that one. But because we have all these these um, these different databases out there that say we know domains, it doesn't mean that the that the, the work is done. And so you can still become the world's foremost expert in specific types of domains that have um, some particular function. So, and when you do find out what those domains do, or first of all, when you discover them, and then you just find out what they do, then you could you could send them to the protein data bank, like this place here. And um, figure, and then you could you could become the you know the the, the 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 reason why the world knows these things because of your research. It's actually quite exciting. I've I actually met somebody when I was in grad school. A domain for something called band three, which was a um, it was a protein that's in blood that allows the blood to to hold on to one molecule of oxygen. Some protein that does that. And apparently, if you don't have that that domain in your blood system or your blood cell. Um, then you can't hold oxygen. And so I met this person, and the protein that he, he didn't discover band three, but he discovered another protein which was um, very intimately connected with band three. And um, he became the world's foremost expert on that particular protein group. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I found this protein that holds oxygen. Isn't that amazing? 
I'm like, yes, that is awesome. <laughs> it's like I was grinning from ear to ear. And this guy was like a superstar, a superstar. Anyhow, um, so there's that. And so you have these domains by, uh, by PDB, which have been basically found out by people. And then once you find out what they, you know, where they are, then you can start taking that same code and applying it to these, you know, this, this modeling, um, these modeling algorithms where you can kind of get an idea about what they look like in three dimension. Um, also, though, but, but getting back to, to places like Uniprop, though, uh, this is PDB. There's, a, there's websites like Uniprop, which I think we've, we've spent some time looking at. Uniprop is actually quite exciting in that um, if you, uh, it doesn't necessarily, your, your whole uh, study of domains isn't just about the, um, you know, what it looks like in three-dimensional space, but rather also um, what's going on inside these, uh, like in, in the domain itself. Like, you know, after the domain begins, for instance, uh, what does the structure look like? Or what is the structure, how would it, how could I make this, this domain, how could I stop this domain if I wanted to? How could I cripple it? How could I make it better? How could I use this domain to work with drugs or something you know, if I wanted to make some kind of therapy? And so you can use something like, um, this is Uniprop, and I can just go ahead and click on one of these domains that I've, that I've looked at here. And so this is saying that inside my protein sequence, this is actually the sequence that handles my domain. And so again, I can run BLAST and all these other things here to kind of get an idea about how other domains or how other proteins use the same domain. It's like kind of like going to a tire show and seeing how other cars use the same kinds of tires that you have. But you get an idea though about where that domain actually is in the sequence, which goes back to the idea that of Centony, where I'm saying, you know, the order that these domains appear in this protein could be used to maybe determine what kind of protein this is. So here we say that uh, this particular domain is appearing like early on, whatever this, whatever this protein sample is, it's showing up early on. But what if I find out that there's another protein, for instance, that the domain shows up at the end? Same sequence, same everything, it's just at the end. That might inform me that perhaps this sequence of, or this protein uh, has a different evolutionary origin from what I was thinking about before. And again, you have this Blast, so you can kind of get an idea about what other proteins exist out there in which this, this domain plays some kind of a role. Um, so there's, what I'm trying to say though is that there's, there's no shortage, there's no shortage of information about domains that we know. Where the shortage lies is that there are seemingly on a daily basis new domains being discovered all the time. And Sadly, we have no idea how those domains work. We have no idea what they do. They're just there. We start, we start noticing that this domain is, that this unknown domain is found in, in one protein, then we start noticing that it's found in a host of other proteins, and it's like found in other places. And, and then we start wondering, could this domain have something to do with an ailment in which this, these proteins um, all appear to play roles? Maybe there's something happening there. Maybe this domain is responsible. Maybe the domain um, can be um, targeted by some some viral protein or something, and then that protein domain is unable to fulfill its, its function because it's, it's, it's you know, glued to some other protein from a virus, um, maybe that's where the sickness comes from. And so you can study these domains, and that's really what they're saying in medicine at the very, very core, could be one of the reasons why you have, um, you know, why you have uh, certain types of disorders that come out of protein problems. Because the domains that are supposed to be doing something, or they're not supposed to be doing something, they are doing something. It's like your, your domain is, is, is being abused in some way. One interesting tool that I wanted to show you, though, and really interesting, is this thing here called String, Functional Protein Associated Networks. This is another online tool. If I go ahead and just click on this, um, let me just go ahead and get us, let me just copy this to memory here. I have my string um, ID, but really what this is, though, is it gives you kind of, um, it's, it's verging on what we call systems biology. And systems biology is a fascinating area. In fact, Dr. Cooper, in her uh, presentation last time in MAP, or in, in our lab, um, was talking about um, systems biology approaches to studying um, um, you know, nutrition uh, and flora and genome um, studies in the gut. But basically, your systems biology means that you're not just studying the protein, but rather you're studying a protein in relation to other proteins, in relation to other stuff. I mean, if you look at yourself, for instance, when you're in, in classes, um, there's you, the student, in class, but there's also you, the student, who's a friend of somebody else who's sitting next to you. There's you, the student, who's in a, in a, in a group working with other people in that class. 
you interact with, you're not just by yourself here, but you're interacting with other people. You're affecting the lives of other people. Just by being you, you're affecting other people's lives in a positive way. But what I'm trying to say, though, is that a systems biology approach to studying you would be to study who you are, who your family is, who your friends are, what classes you're taking, what buildings you go to to take those classes, what campus you, you go to, what state you're living in, what the weather is around you, um, what music you listen to when you're, when you're, it's everything about you. It's like all that other stuff. It's, it's, it's everything about you. It's not just what's your favorite protein, but it's like how, how do you use that protein in, ten, in, in terms of other things. And so string is, is kind of making a, an attempt at doing that. And so that's why we're going to spend some, we'll spend some time talking about this. Um, but if you go ahead and just click on search, I'll just go ahead and put in the protein name here, P01899, which is something that's actually, it's, it's on the slides, so you can always get back to this later on. But if you go there and do a search, um, hopefully we'll get this thing done without, without it slowing down. Um, yes, here we go. So this is a kind of a systems biology look at somehow, at, some, at how some of these, 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 uh, these domains interact uh, with other domains. Uh, here's like, and just like, and how proteins interact with other proteins. I think that here we're looking at different types of proteins. But this is actually quite interesting though, because these are nodes of different proteins, and they're connected by edges. That's what these lines are. We call them edges. Um, the edges are actually the kinds of, you know, they're evidence of some kind of connection that exists between this protein and something else. And so the, you'll notice that each node here has a different color. Each edge represents a different kind of observation or something different. I think that the uh, green line represents that uh, there's some literature that connects these proteins together. That means there's some paper that exists to say that, for instance, in this case here, if you're looking at this uh, um, serpent B, um, you'll see that this one here is connected. Oops, sorry, it's, it's this one here. If I can get this thing so I kind of move around here. <laughs> I'm just clicking on all kinds of things. Um, but you'll see that this, these two proteins up here, uh, I'll zoom in, but there's this protein here. This, if you can see this, this green line here, I think that represents that there's some kind of a, some kind of a, you know, a, a, there's a piece of, there's a paper that's written to say that these two proteins have some kind of connection. And maybe that's because they have the same types of domain. But what I wanted to show you though, is that if you go to, if I can hopefully find that here, there is uh, viewers, and I click on network, uh, is it network here, or is it legends somewhere? They changed this from what I was looking at before. Oh, settings, here we go. Let's click on settings. And if you go down to settings, you look at this um, interactive sources here, or active interaction sources. You can see that these are all the, that's how you control the edges here. You have text mining, experiments, databases, co-expression, co-occurrence, gene fusion, neighborhood. These are all different ways of saying how one gene, or how, sorry, how not gene, but how one protein is connected to another. And you might find that because they're connected, that means that they're, they have similar types of functions or they do similar types of things. And so databases is actually kind of interesting. That means um, databases is like looking at different types of, or these, these different public domains where somebody has made a discovery and they put in there, in, they put in this, do, this, this public domain or this database. I shouldn't call it da a domain, because you might confuse that with, with, with protein domains. But they're just basically places where, where, where experimenters can put their results. And then the database says, okay, this is knowledge I can use now to infer the relatedness between this protein that you found and other proteins that you also found. And so that's what the database is. But one thing that I find most interesting, if I go ahead and just turn all these things off, um, if I look at text mining, for instance, how do I go? I go to update. You'll find that these, all these connections here, are saying that there's a paper to say that that says that somebody, someplace, has found that there's a connection between these two, uh, these two nodes, which is quite interesting. And maybe that connection has something to do with a, you know, the common domains. I think these are all just proteins, but it might mean that they have a common functions. If they have common functions, could that mean that maybe the domains are common? Is there something else going on that we need to know about? between these two different do or nodes to find out what they do. And so, for instance, if I'm studying one of these things here, I can just go ahead and like, I think you can click on the edges themselves. And you get all kinds of inf inf in, uh, information about the interaction that exists between these two things here. So for instance, I clicked on this red, this red node here that you can hopefully see blinking. 
And this is a class H, or H2 class one histocompatibility antigen. It's a DB alpha chain involved in the presentation of foreign antigens to the immune system, and it belongs to the uh, MHC class one family. And so here's this other node that I find here. It's a killer cell lectin-like receptor seven, receptor on natural killer cells for, uh, for class one uh, MHC. And so there is some connection between these two proteins, something. It doesn't really tell you what that connection is, but maybe, for instance, this paper that came out that says that, that these two things are somehow connected because of this commonality, maybe they, this is your, this is your um, I, I guess, the piece of the puzzle that you're trying to, that you're trying to find to give you some idea about how to, use these, uh, how to use these proteins in therapeutics. Maybe. If you find out that they're both connected in some way, it could be that there's something that you could use in that to, um, to make some therapeutic or to make a discovery. I like to think about this a lot, actually. This is, in fact, this is my research area, in case you're, if you're wondering why I'm talking about the text mining part first. Maybe on Friday I'll show you some of my research, but actually I do, in my own research, I create these same types of networks. Um, these ones appear to be a little bit uh, more colorful than mine, but I make the same kind of networks here, and in my networks, the, the nodes that I find here are connected by an edge, and that edge suggests that there is a paper that somehow connects them together, or rather, the ideas in these two papers, or the ideas in these two, in fact, my, my nodes are papers, but the ideas in these papers are, um, have some overlap. There's some connections between these, these two pa research papers. I'll see if I can give you some, uh, some time to talk about that. But basically, though, that's, that's what, this, this, what this tool for me represents. Like, you can find some of these papers in this way. Um, I can find out experiments at the same time. I can just go ahead and click on experiments. I'll hit update, and I can see what's kind of going on here. And now you can see that I have now red, red lines, that, or red edges, rather, that connect my nodes. And this is saying, for instance, it could be that there's a paper that, that exists to, 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 you know, to connect these two proteins together. Maybe they're the same domains. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe the functions are the same. I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to read the paper to find out. But I do know that maybe I should start by reading the papers that have these pink lines next to them, because this suggests that there is some experimental evidence, not theoretical stuff, but necessarily, but not, you know, not necessarily just theoretical, but experimental, I would say, um, to suggest that uh, we actually have more than just speculation on these things. So for instance, look at these two protein or these two uh, nodes here. I have uh, KLRA3 and I have II. Um, I have these two nodes here, and that's interesting. There, there's a paper that, that connects them, but there's no experiment that connects them. And so this paper could be very theoretical, or maybe this is your opportunity to actually run an experiment between these two different proteins and find what connects them, what's similar. For instance, maybe you'll, run the, you'll do an experiment and you'll find out that these two proteins have many of the same domains, they fulfill the same types of duties, and they're both involved in the onset of Parkinson's disease. And so maybe that's your research area. Um, these other papers that exist here may not necessarily follow the literature that you're, that you're seeing on your screen now, but they might. But I think that it, it always helps. It always helps that you, if you have um, if you have some experimental data between proteins, um, that can always that can only help your your case if you're saying that um, I'm studying this protein. I believe this protein works with another protein, and then someone might say to you, "Well, how do you know that that protein works with another protein?" And then you'll say, "Well, because I know that this there there are experiments that exist uh, where this protein has been found interacting with other proteins." So you have all that, which is actually quite, and it's, it's quite interesting, but this is getting back to the kind of like the systems biology effect. Um, and that's because you're not just looking at, at one protein like in isolation here, but rather you're looking at how this protein works with all these other proteins. Like how do they, how do they react together? And you might find though that in order for you to deliver the, the therapeutics that you're trying to do, or the, you know, the, you know, deliver the, the uh, you know, so to, to do something, to fix some, some, some uh, disorder, um, it's not just a, t a task where one protein is involved, but rather other proteins are involved. Everything else is involved. And maybe, for instance, you're working with the, the, you know, the domain in this, in this protein here, and then, for instance, you have to work with this domain over here, too, or sorry, um, maybe this domain here, you're working with this, this domain over here because they have some kind of connection between them. And maybe, for instance, also this, this uh, KLRA1 has to, has to have, you have to work with that, that domain in some way because they're all working together. 
And if you can knock out those domains in some way, or you can do the, or fix them in some way, then perhaps you're inventing drugs, or I, mean, I say drugs, not illegal drugs, but therapeutics. You're making therapeutics to fix something. Anyway, um, there are some, uh, <laughs> we're, not even, we're not even close to being done here. When we come back on, on, on Friday, we'll finish this discussion. Um, do you spend some time looking through this? I think I just have some, um, there's just some other slides here that talk about like, you know, how to use string in, in some more detail. It's actually kind of interesting to play with. I do find though that if you're just bored or you have to, you're on the phone with somebody, if you just like dial up any old random protein and just start playing with these things, it's actually kind of fun. But as you're doing this, be sure to like to actually click on these nodes though and find out more about what the nodes are, like what exactly is going on here. And when you have to take that boring phone call with, from you know whoever it is, you can play with this thing, but also learn protein at the same time, which is actually kind of cool. Anyhow, um, that is class today. I will let you know um, th by next class, I'm hoping, um, about what's going on in, in lab next week. Um, I'm thinking that we'll have our speaker during our lab, and so therefore we would not have that time for presentations like I had originally said, so we'd have to have next week presentations would happen during class time. But I'll give you plenty of warning about that. Um, today there is no lab because we have our test on Wednesday, and I think it's only fair that if you have a test coming up in the middle of the week, having a lab right before that is a little bit cumbersome. <laughs> it's just, it, maybe, that, maybe that's just me. I mean, maybe you guys are, are, more, are stronger than, than I am here, but I always find that for me that's just too much. And so there's no lab today, but there is class on Wednesday. Well, no, sorry, there's no class on Wednesday, but there, there is the test on Wednesday, and you'll be picking that up on, on Sakai. I will send out Slack messages to remind. <laughs>